The Moton Mailbag is brought to you by the Robert Russo Moton Museum, located in Farmville, Virginia. The Moton Museum is a civil rights museum focusing on the history of Prince Edward County between 1951 and 1964. Hello everybody, my name is Kanan Townsend, Director of Education and Outreach at the Robert Russo Moat Museum located in Farmville, Virginia. And I'm Leah Brown, the Assistant Director for Education here at Moton, and this is Moat Mailbag Season 2. The Moat Museum is a civil rights museum focusing on the history of Prince Edward County between 1951 and 1964. The Moat Mailbag is a weekly listener question show. Each week we'll answer questions about U.S. history, African American culture, civil rights, and more that are submitted by our listeners. Feel free to submit via Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or you can email us at info at moatmuseum.org. Yes, please, please send in your questions. We need your questions. We have a pretty decent backlog going so far, but we always are welcoming new questions are coming in. So it's been a while, Leah. You know, we last recorded back in May and this, you know, episode 10 of season one probably released back in June or maybe even July. Either way, it's been a while since you've heard us. So just checking in. How are things going for you? How is life? A lot has changed in four months. Yeah. So, okay, guys. October's coming. Spooky season is on the way. And ColourPop is my go-to for affordable, good makeup. And they have a new Hocus Pocus theme line coming out on the Sanderson Sisters. And I know I do not need all of it. However... (laughs) <laughs> we'll see. Because there's three shades of red lipstick, and don't you always need a new shade of red lipstick? That's how I feel about it. So I'm excited for spooky season. I, mean, I find myself running out quite a bit. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I'm, I I don't mind Halloween and spooky season and fall and, and all that fun stuff, but I'm just like, bring on November. Bring on my holiday music and Thanksgiving. Oh my gosh. And then happy holidays the throughout 2020. Um, yeah, I feel like we could all use this, like that pick me up of the holiday season, season, season. You know, given to your neighbors. You know, the spirit of Thanksgiving just throughout the whole kind of latter portion of 2020 because it's been, it's been a slog. It's been a slog. Yeah, it's been a, a slog. Little, little rough, a little rough around the edges. But I think that is a perfect segue into what on earth has been happening. So I'll let Leah get us started with our first question. Okay, so at Moton, while we were close to the public, we did a lot of, well, I finished a lot of our digital programs. We can now offer 14 digital programs for grades 3 through 12, um, and then also did some on-site programming with the hope for when we can gather back together again. There's nothing like being in the Moton, and I just love to see students roll in. It's like, hey guys, welcome. I'm glad you're here and then we get into it we get into the story the history the advocacy and the power students actually have oh and then on down the pipeline working on a short course for teachers covering uh, things like primary sources how to put them in the classroom civil rights literature in the classroom basically trying to bridge the gap between civil rights history and story with the classroom and timing that's why i'm going on how about you? Yeah, there's been a lot. I mean, you know, when we closed back in March, I mean, we just had no idea what was going to happen, right? Um, and in many ways, we still don't have a clue what's going to happen. Back in March, when we first closed, you know, we just kind of had a moment to sit and observe everything that was happening and to try to take stock and see where we needed to go next. I mean, we went from doing all in person, on site in our museum in Farmville to doing all virtual and social media. And, you know, we started the Moton Interview Series. We start, started this podcast in and of itself. Um, and this was a lot, you know, for us who this is not necessarily our kind of natural wheelhouse. So, you know, coming down the pike, we've got some really cool stuff that is happening. Um, during COVID, we received a pretty big grant from NEH, which we've been working very hard. Um, and we're going to be creating a virtual exhibit, um, which is going to be finished by the end of December, which is going to be a tremendous resource for, for educators um, through our previous IMLS grant, we've still been plugging away at. Um, so look forward to teacher professional development opportunities that will be coming out of that, uh, volunteer and docent training, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yeah, so we're, we're really just kind of making sure to produce quality, 
quality content, uh, quality programming. You know, so for instance, uh, September is we celebrate the observance of Reverend L. Francis Griffin Day. Uh, and so instead of doing something in person, which we likely were not going to be able to do, we did a faith and leadership kind of interview series where we interviewed several folks, one of which being uh, Reverend Griffin's son, eldest son, Rep. Skip Griffin, L. Francis Griffin Jr. Um, I interviewed him to kind of get a definitive interview about him and his mother. Um, we talked with some people who are currently active in the social justice kind of spheres and circles, um, but kind of do that as a part of, of their ministry. So, yeah, I think we've done a pretty good, pretty good job. You know, we've, we've created a lot of good stuff, but, you know, more, more to come. And we'll see kind of how things grow and adapt as the situation grows and adapts. Mm-hmm. So. All right. So on to the next question. Yeah. So Kanan, why is history important? You know, this is a hard question, but it's also a very easy question. And I, my, I could answer this in two seconds and say, why isn't history important? History of math, history of science, history of society, history of culture. Everything has a history, right? But I think the big thing and what I've been on a, a big kind of tirade about lately um, or on my soapbox, rather, not a tirade, but um, is if you don't take the time to learn the history, you don't recognize kind of patterns in the history of discrimination and marginalization of people of certain backgrounds. You know, if you don't take the time to learn the history, then history will repeat itself. You know, cliche, but so true, right? Um, a lot of these issues are not new. You know, discrimination isn't new. Racism isn't new. Gerrymandering, redlining, you know, none of the stuff is, is new, right? It's been happening for a very long time. It just might be dressed up a little bit differently. Um, one of my favorite quotes that one of my uh, good friends who works at the Virginia Holocaust Museum says, you know, if you wondered what you'd be doing during slavery, during the Holocaust, during the civil rights movement, you're doing it right now, right? Because a lot of these issues, most all, if not all of these issues are still going on. It just looks a little bit different. I mean, so history is the example, right? Um, a lot of people, you know, ask me, Lee, I'm not sure about you, but like, you know, how are you feeling right now? I'm like uh, exasperated, drained, overwhelmed, but uh, you know, looking back at the his- history, you know, it's an example of, of we can overcome, right? At least to a certain extent. It's just a series of overcomings. You know, I don't, you never fully overcome. That's why you keep fighting so you don't get complacent. Um, yeah, especially working here at, at Moton. I mean, the, a lot, and, and in my opinion, you know, the black experience also, often gets portrayed as tragedy, right? And you know, we always talk about slavery. You know, we always talk about you know, the eventual civil rights movement, but never about, you know, the resiliency and the grit in, in that community to continue fighting, you know, so all the issues that are still occurring today, you know, all the people who are still being, you know, targeted and, and, and attacked and, and, and murdered, you know, we, we keep fighting, right? We keep persisting. We, we show that resilience and we continue. But without that example of history, right, and recent history, you know, we can't we can't do that in an effective way without treading some of the same stuff we, we've done that didn't work so well. So I think history is important on a myriad of levels but that to to say the least so i'll pause there what about you yeah i mean so history is how we understand what is happening in 2020 because decisions were made to put things in place that have changed people's potentials i mean we were i mean just the sheer number of well this morning reading an article about a county who apologized for their role in segregation But then their 2020 context of how the students who are of color are still being impacted. It's like, well, we see the the time difference, the change, but things in place are still harming people of color. And then we think about, you know, I love the Constitution now. The 14th Amendment, equal protection under the law, we don't have that yet. It's not there for people of color. And to ignore it is to be willfully ignorant of what is going on. And the fact that people have privilege because of just what their skin color is, because people who had that same skin color made the laws that put it on the books. So it's kind of a mix of understanding how we got here and then what actions we can take to move forward. Right. You know, like you were speaking about the resilience of the black community. The I'm in awe of grassroots activism, you know, Lemison Ella Baker, her job her idea was to empower the people to speak for themselves. You don't need a spokesperson. You have a voice. You have a mind. You have your own community. We're currently engaging with the American Association 
her state and local history and their big themes are over and over again it's been engage with the community know your community be a part of your community and then the museum aspect be part of your community and have your community be part of your museum mm-hmm. one of the presenters explained that certain museums have the expectation the community would help them when they drop the ball it ignores their relationship that is essential for conversation and I feel like in Moton, I'm spoiled because we have that already. Right. Our community is the museum because their stories are make up the museum. That's the power of the Moton Museum itself. The personal history is personal stories. So I feel like we're held ahead of the ball. It's what's exciting for me. But, you know, history is just how people's actions have changed the next thing. And it's not a one-trick pony. They're the power of perspectives with history. If all you know about slavery is that people were tortured, which is true, you don't get the people who were perpetuating it, who felt like it was okay because of their own reasons. I know one of the programs you do, it's like people go through their value systems to kind of explain why people in the past made certain decisions because it reflects their values. Put that in a 2020 context, What people are doing now reflects their values. And you can't think about today without looking backwards to explain how we got here. History is important because it explains what is going on and helps us know what to do moving forward. Yeah, history is the solution, right? Like I think the Constitution, when it was written, you know, all men are created equal. I mean, well, that actually, I'm going to... Yeah, I agree. And I think history is the cause of and the solution to all of our problems. That's for sure. Last question. How did the surrounding counties, Cumberland County, Buckingham County, Amelia, Appomattox, Nottoway, Charlotte, and Central Lunenburg respond to the school closings in Prince Edward County between 1959 and 1964? Okay. So a lot of people, a lot of places, a lot of movement. Ended up being that some families they would, all right, if a child from Prince Edward had a sibling, they would go stay with their sibling. But eventually, counties like Lunenburg found out and then they stopped all of that. And they were like, we get it, we want to help, but we can't have all this influx of students, which makes sense, but also help. And then there were instances where people actually sent their, their children for education, but they lied about their address. So Ted, I mean, obviously they didn't live there, but their address was. So try to find the methods and the means to get some form of education while keeping their children close to home. I feel like for me, the shock of how far some of those students went for school is horrifying. Cause like just the distance and how everything you miss every single day when your kids come to tell you about in school, if they're not with you, they can't tell you what's happening in school. So I mean, I get it. I get it. You know, the the general sentiment kind of during the time when the schools first closed, I mean, the other counties wanted to help, right? At least in theory, the problem was Uncle Sam, right? The taxes, right? If these students are coming to these schools that are already severely underfunded because they were colored schools, you're putting much more of a strain on the tax dollars that went into funding the school in the first place. So that's why a lot of these school di- districts kind of crack down on people lying about their addresses. Um, so people had to be very creative about going to schools in other counties if they were to. Uh, one story in particular, there was this father of this family unit, and he had a job in Appomattox County. And what he did was, with the help of some of his coworkers, he rented an abandoned house that was in Appomattox County. He put a you know a couple layers of paint on the on the front, and he put some curtains up to make it look like people were living here, living there rather. But in reality, the house was condemned. So every day he would drop his kids. I think there was five of them, I believe, off behind the house, and then they would hide outside the house until the bus came. Then they would walk through the back door and walk around holes in the floor and such and come out the front of the of this house and get on the bus to ride to school now they did this all throughout the rest of their school careers you know they never returned to school in prince Edward county um you know and and some of them at some point there was upwards of 21 people doing the same thing with them because they kind of caught on and were like look well if you need you know education is very important so come join us now that meant that you know, you might have three six-year-olds and a couple of 10-year-olds or, or whatnot. And, and so then these siblings presumably had some explaining to do. Like, okay, you're the same age and you're the same age. 
but you're not twins, so how's that work? And it was a shrug. I don't know, right? And the bus driver wasn't dumb. He knew or she knew what was happening. And the bus driver wasn't stupid. They knew what was going on, but they knew how important education was to these students. I mean, truly, to summarize that time period, education for African-Americans was truly a privilege and not a right. Um, and, and so they took it very, very seriously. And it's something they really wanted to attain back. So a lot of folks tried to go to schools in the surrounding counties. But again, only so much could, could be done. So, of course, many students went away to live with distant relatives. You know, there was, the, of course, the Kittrell Junior College program that was started. Um, and then the American Friends and Services Committee sent some younger kids as far west as Iowa and as far north as Connecticut to live with complete strength your host families and then of course the contingent of people here who went without argument but the, the the majority who went without education for some some time so yeah not not an ideal situation but certainly in times of covid i mean this question kind of you know harkens the the comparison now in times of covid lots of folks are making comparison between you know students being virtually educated at home kind of back in in march ish time to you know to these students being locked out and what i will say is that you know, there is the similarity in the sense that they're out of school. But what I do think these students who are out virtually or, you know, or hybrid or whatever the case is to use this story as an example, right, that education can and does continue. Right. You know, schools may have been closed in Prince Edward County, but they were still having school at the, at the kitchen table. Right. And in living rooms and in basements and in bedrooms and in churches, you know, they, they persisted, they continued, you know, through the face of adversity. And they didn't have broadband. I mean, heck, in places in Prince Edward County, there's no indoor plumbing, let alone Wi-Fi, right? And so, you know, I think using the school closure comparison to, you know, virtual education can be a useful one if it's a source of, of, of inspiration, right? If it's just an example to say, hey, if they can make it through that five years without a public school, we can make it through this. And we have a lot more going for us than they did for them. So let's use them you know, as mentors. Let them help us to kind of get through this time period for as long as that might be. Because what happened then was super unprecedented. Um, so with that, we are at about 17 minutes, which is a good length, I think, for episode one of season two. Leah, anything else you want to mention? Nothing I can think of right now. Great. I will always take the chance to shamelessly plug, you know, follow us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, follow our YouTube page. We're going to do something new for this season. We're going to also, in addition to being able to find this wherever podcasts are found, you can find them on YouTube also. So in case you want to show it, you know, in a class or or just be able to access it a little bit easier. So follow us on YouTube, all platforms at Moten Museum. So that's going to be it for today. Again, make sure you do follow us to stay what's happening at Moton. Join us next week, same time, same place. And I think we settled in on Mondays at 9 a.m. We will upload, but of course, you can listen to it anytime. You'll find episode two in the feed and be sure to send us your questions. Thanks for tuning in.